Hey everyone, it's Sarah with RegisteredNurseRN.com and in this video I'm going to be doing an NCLEX review over diverticulosis and diverticulitis. And this video is part of an NCLEX review series over the GI system, so be sure to check out those other videos. And as always, in the YouTube description below or at the end of this YouTube video, you can access the free review quiz that will test you on this condition. So let's get started. First, let's start out talking about diverticulosis. Okay, diverticulosis is the formation of hollow sac cavities throughout the intestinal wall. And as you can see through this little illustration here, this is just part of the large intestine, the bowel wall, the three layers, have started to lose their integrity. And instead of just being nice and uniform, they've started to herniate out and create these pouch areas which can um, turn into complications, which we'll talk about a little bit later. And a person can have these anywhere throughout the intestine, but they tend to be the most common in the sigmoid colon. And let's um, recap on our anatomy and physiology a little bit. So um, you have your stomach, and then you have the small intestine, and then you have your large intestine, which is referred to as your colon and your rectum. And you have the ascending colon, transverse colon, descending, sigmoid, and then the rectum. Now, many patients can have many of these outpouching areas. So um, whenever you have a lot of them, they're referred to as diverticula. Or a patient can have just a single one and they're referred to as diverticulum. But if they have a single one, um, over time they will probably develop more and they can increase in size. Now when patients have diverticulosis, they're usually asymptomatic. They don't usually have symptoms. And if they do have symptoms, they're usually these random symptoms that they may attribute to something else. Like a change in their bowel pattern, um, constipation, diarrhea, or abdominal bloating. And many people tend to find out about diverticulosis at random or when they develop um, one of these complications. And I have had a lot of patients who um, have went for uh, a lower GI series and the results came back and I went over them with them and um, it showed that they had diverticulosis and it showed a lot of these diverticula throughout the intestine and they were really shocked to find out that they had this. Um, so this is how patients tend to usually find out. So what are the causes of diverticulosis? Well, it's not 100% known, but they think it's due to a low fiber diet. And whenever you eat foods that are low in fiber, your stools tend to be smaller and drier than when compared to eating foods with high fiber, which tend to be softer and bulkier. So your patients um, who may be eating a lot of low fiber, they can develop constipation and straining because it's harder to push that stool out. Well, whenever you're doing that, when you're straining, trying to get stool out, this can increase the pressure in the colon, causing herniation of those areas. So um, since it tends to be a lot in your sigmoid colon, patient does eat a lot of low fiber, they have a lot of constipation or straining, it tends to make sense that all that increased pressure from trying to push that stool out of the rectum is gonna back up into that sigmoid colon, cause that wall over time to just become weak and herniate out. Because patients who tend to have diverticulosis tend to develop this later on in life, middle age to older age, and it tends to run in families. Now, how do they diagnose diverticulosis? One way is through a colonoscopy where they um, use a scope and go in and look at that. And if you ever have a patient who goes for one of those, um, you're taking care of them and they'll be coming back to you and you can look at the test results. A lot of times the physician will um, upload the pictures that they took with the scope. Try to look at those and um, get an idea of what it looks like because it's very interesting looking because inside of these areas that have the diverticula, you will see instead of it being nice and smooth and pink, these areas, there will be these dark hole crater looking areas throughout that um, intestine and it's very unique looking and once you see it, you'll never forget it. Another way they can um, look at this is through a barium enema or a CT scan of the abdomen 
with contrast can um, show if they have diverticulosis. Now let's talk about the complications with diverticulosis. Um, one, one thing a person can have is called diverticular bleeding. And um, what happens is around these herniated sacs are arteries and these arteries supply the intestines so they can do their job. Well, as that herniated area expands, that bowel wall starts to thin, that artery becomes superficial, and that artery wall can break down. And whenever it breaks down, it can release blood and the patient can have a bleed. And we don't like when arteries bleed because they are very dangerous. Um, so what the patient may have is painless bleeding. They may see blood in the rectum coming out or uh, bright blood in the stool. And if that happens, they definitely need to go in and get that fixed. Another thing they can have is called diverticulitis, which we're going to talk about in depth here in a moment. And this is where one of these herniated pouches becomes inflamed. That's where you get the itis, the I-T-I-S part. And this causes the patient a lot of pain and um, an abscess can form and it can rupture its contents into the abdominal cavity. So you'll get peritonitis and sepsis, cause a lot of problems. Another thing they can get is a stricture or an obstruction. And this is where you get narrowing of the bowel wall and uh, the GI contents will have trouble even flowing through there and uh, it will get blocked. Another thing is the formation of a fistula. And with diverticulosis, bladder or um, vaginal formation of a fistula tends to be the most common. And what happens is that just really because of the nature of where these organs are located, within the anatomy of the body. And here's the bladder. And what can happen with the fistula is that an opening can be created and it allows a passage slash channel to allow the contents of the intestine to flow into the bladder. And the bladder is a sterile organ and it's not good whenever that happens because all that bacteria is gonna flow into that bladder. Now. Um, fistulas, other types of fistulas that can happen but are not as common, you can have a, um, a fistula from intestine to intestine or to the skin. But typically, um, fistulas to intestine to bladder are the most common when diverticulosis. Now let's look a little bit more in depth to diverticulitis. And we know that this is where one of these herniated pouches has become inflamed. So what exactly causes this? They're not 100% sure, but there are some theories. Now, um, an important thing to keep in mind is that not all patients with diverticulosis will develop diverticulitis. Um, I've had patients in their 80s, 90s, they have a history of diverticulosis and they have never developed this. So not all patients will develop this. Um, one thing they think happens is that stool gets stuck in one of these pouches from straining. Um, say the person follows low fiber diet, um, low fiber diets, the stool tends to stay in the colon longer and it requires a lot of effort to push out. So um, if they have a lot of stool up in this area and they're pushing, increasing that pressure can easily just push some stool into those herniated sacs, get stool in there, um, a bad area for um, infection to start brewing into those pouches. Uh, they used to think and tell people with diverticulosis to avoid eating seeds or nuts that they could get stuck in there, but now they're looking at it and um, that tends to not be the case. So they really don't have to avoid completely eating those foods like how they used to think they should. Um, other causes, they think that due to the increased pressure in the colon that it's leading to tears in the diverticula. So um, you get a tear, uh, bacteria can invade, and then you get infection. So those are some theories. Now, what are the complications of diverticulitis? Well, what happens is you get inflammation and um, whenever you get inflammation, you can have bacteria form in there and it can form just this beautiful little sac full of infection. So we have an abscess. Now, if that abscess is in there long enough, um, it can rupture because it's gonna break down that bowel wall. All that inflammation, cells do not like to be inflamed and they wear out and they just um, give up and the whole wall will rupture. When it ruptures, we will get peritonitis and all that infection and bacteria that's naturally in the intestines will just spill into the abdominal cavity and um, 
patient needs treatment fast because they can die. Another thing is obstruction from all that inflammation happening. It can narrow that bowel wall and cause obstruction. Uh, the patient, of course, will have pain from this happening. They will have fever from um, the immune response and increased white blood cells from the immune response. Now, um, how can you remember the typical signs and symptoms for diverticulitis? Remember the word pouch because we have an inflamed pouch. Um, P4 abdominal pain, pain, and a lot of times the pain is going to be most likely in the left lower quadrant. Why in the left lower quadrant? Well, think back to your anatomy, how your intestines set. Most diverticulitis is, um, or osis, is in your sigmoid colon, and that tends to be in the left lower quadrant, so the patient may have pain there. O4, you may observe bloating and blood in the stool and um, bloating in the abdomen, and then U for unrelenting cramps. Patients who have diverticulitis um, will describe their pain as intense cramping. Had a family member who had a severe case of diverticulitis. She's had six kids, and she said that the cramping that she got with the diverticulitis was almost worse than childbirth. So this is very, very intense pain that these patients will feel. C for constipation, most commonly going to have constipation. They can have diarrhea, but typically constipation. And then H for high fever, um, they're going to be running very extreme high temperatures and um, even higher if it ruptures and peritonitis when all that um, infection rushes into the abdominal cavity. Now how treatments? As a nurse, you just want to be familiar with the treatments and then we're going to go over nursing interventions. Okay, treatments. They can go in and drain the abscess of that infected pouch, remove that. Uh, for mild cases, they can prescribe oral antibiotics and then bowel rest and then slowly reintroduce certain foods. Moderate cases to severe usually requires hospitalization where they'll be getting IV antibiotics, IV fluids, maybe even on fat emulsion solutions because they're going to be MPO for a while, like TPN and complete bowel rest, and for chronic cases, because some patients will have diverticulitis, they'll take their oral antibiotics, they clear up, and then six months later, they'll get it again. And that's really, really hard on the bowel. So with chronic cases, they can go in and do a bowel resection where they will remove the disease part of the colon, wherever it's at, and then reconnect healthy with healthy. So we've removed the diverticulosis areas that are prone to inflammation. However, some patients have this so bad that they may require multiple surgeries where they can't immediately reconnect those healthy areas. So they may have to um, get a temporary colostomy. And we talked a whole review about uh, colostomies and ileostomies. If you want to check that out, cards should be popping up. And um, what they will do, they'll let the bowel get a little bit more healthier, and then um, whenever it's time, they can go back and reconnect and then remove that ostomy so that is gone. Now let's look at the nursing interventions. What are you gonna do for the patient as the nurse who has diverticulitis? Okay, um, as a nurse, you really want to focus on GI assessment and the diet regimen. That is the big thing that test questions like to ask whenever you're dealing with a patient with diverticulitis is what they can and can't eat during certain phases and what you should be doing as the nurse. Okay, during the initial phase, this is the phase where the patient has symptoms. That sac, that herniated sac in there, the pouch is inflamed. They're very, very sick. So what are you going to be doing during that phase? Um, for moderate to severe cases, uh, usually they'll be hospitalized. The doctor will, like I said earlier, prescribe an IV antibiotics. If it's a mild case, it'll be oral, so you'll be administering those. Um, diet during this time will be nothing by mouth while those symptoms are presenting. And um, instead, they'll have like IV fluids. Now, as the nurse, you're gonna be assessing for signs and symptoms of peritonitis because they are at major risk of that um, herniated pouch that's infected to rupture and spill its contents into the abdominal cavity. And for some signs and symptoms you wanna be watching out for are an unrelenting fever. The fever, you know, they're on these IV antibiotics, their fever actually is getting worse. And they have worsening abdominal pain, even though you're giving them pain medicine around the clock. Um, increased heart rate increased respirations, abdominal bloating is getting worse. Those could all be signs of peritonitis. 
Um, you'll be giving pain medications and monitoring their hydration status. Now, during the recovery phase, as those signs and symptoms start to go away, the patient's starting to get a little bit better. Um, per the physician's order, you'll um, probably be ordered to start them on a clear liquid diet. And the rule of thumb, anything you can see through, you can give them as long as it doesn't have pulp. So no like juices with pulp in it. Um, so that would include broth, jello, and pulp-free clear juices like apple juice, things like that. So the patient tolerates that, they do good. The next day, probably start them on a low fiber, low residual diet. This is the only time a patient with diverticulosis will um, need to consume low fiber because they're inflamed, they're sick, the gut needs to rest, and it needs foods that require the, less e the least effort to digest. So that's low fiber. And um, that includes foods like white rice, cooked or skinned fruits and vegetables, not fresh, they need to be cooked or skinned, or eggs. And during this phase, no high fiber foods or like seeds or nuts because that requires a lot of digestive effort on the gut and we don't want that. Now, once they're completely healed, signs and symptoms are gone, all the inflammation's gone, they want to reintroduce high fiber foods in their diet because we don't want them to get constipated and have to strain, which is gonna increase pressure in that colon, which increases the chances of stool just going back down into those herniated sacs or tearing one of those diverticula and causing this condition. So <clears throat> they'll want to consume fresh fruits and vegetables, oats, grains, and beans and drink plenty of fluids, about two to three liters a day, as long as they, uh, it's not contraindicated, like they're on a fluid restriction as in heart failure or renal failure, always be observant of that. And um, the doctor may order a fiber supplement called psyllium, also called Metamucil. What this does is it helps the stool um, become softer and bulkier, and it does that by absorbing the water from the intestine. So um, the patient can pass the stool easier. And to take this, they will mix it with eight ounces of water and drink it. And um, also the physician may prescribe probi probiotics, which will help maintain healthy gut flora. And as I talked about earlier, research is now showing that um, it's okay um, once the patient is healed that they can um, eat seeds and nuts and fruits with seeds and nuts, things like that, because it isn't linked to diverticulitis. But you know, if the patient's intolerant to it to begin with, um, they wouldn't want to consume it, but studies are showing that it's okay now. Okay, so that wraps up this NCLEX review. Thank you so much for watching. Don't forget to take the free quiz and to subscribe to our channel for more videos.